Bom dia a todos e so todas. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Fabiola Zerbini. I am the director for the Agriculture Land Use uh, and Reforesting Program for WRI Brazil. It's a pleasure to be here with you. We apologize for our little delay, but we're starting off now and we're going to keep the whole programming for our event. We are with interpretation available from English into Portuguese. Vice versa, I'll be moderating that into Portuguese, but our speakers will be speaking in English. So we kindly ask you all to use the globe icon right at the bottom of the page so that you can set to the language that you prefer to listen to. In a short while, we'll be translation available into Spanish and French. Just hold on a minute, uh, but to make sure we're starting the event so that we can keep up with the timing for everyone. So this event is in the context of a bigger project called Promoting and Implementing Natural, uh, assisted natural regeneration in the states of Mato Grosso and Pará. It is funded by the uh, government of Norway, counting on the partnership of WRI and also with the partnership of ICV and Amazon and Suzano, which is a two-year project. And this event celebrates the ending of the first of three phases, which is exactly the one focused on systematizing and know what we have in terms of assisted natural regeneration, especially in Brazil, but also some cases around the world, so that we can identify the elements of more power and the points of convergence, and also the diversity that the mechanism and the practice allows us, as well as the impact that somehow of what they are driven to. This event, beyond starting with this publication, uh, is the beginning of phases two and three. So it's a great moment of listening, a good moment for reflection on the main learning those cases are teaching us uh, so that we have continuity with the project in a more verticalized way in the states of Farai Mato Grosso so that happens in the best possible way with the best possible results. And therefore with all the power that assisted natural regeneration promises and actually delivers. So we have three different uh, moments here. We start with the starting considerations and the first remarks where our partners will bring in their main inputs uh, for the project and how it's happened so far. Then we are going to go to know a little deeper the concept or whatever is more advanced in terms of science around uh, assisted natural regeneration and also get to know the cases of this publication, the methodology, and the key results that we managed to achieve. Right next, we are going to go to a panel with some partners so that we can talk about uh, how we can speed up the process and how can we can potentialize our agenda and effectively deliver uh, all the promises and all the potential that the team offers to us. I'm going to start off with the First remarks with my colleague, uh, Walter Vergara, who is the leader of the 2020 initiative here, is the team of uh, restoration claro uh, que in Latin America. So you've got three minutes to start off. Thanks for attending the launch of the report on assisted natural regeneration in scaling up forests and landscape restoration. First, a word of thanks and acknowledgement to the authors of the report for successfully illustrating the challenges and opportunities for ANR. In particular, I would like to thank the partnership with our colleagues at WRI Brazil, ICV, Amazon, and Susano, and all others involved in this effort. This is a timely report on a much needed effort to enable nature to heal. The moment is of urgency as illustrated by the UN designated decade of land restoration for the period 2021 to 2030. In Latin America, 58% of greenhouse gas emissions come from land-based actions, with two thirds of those linked to land use change, mainly deforestation. Every year about 3 million hectares of forests and other natural vegetation are disappearing. Deforestation is also linked to losses of biodiversity, soil quality, changes in rainfall, and impacts on water and energy supply. 
Short of outright conservation, A and R is the most cost-effective tool to promote restoration of degraded lands. At Initiative 2020, a Latin American effort to change the dynamics of land degradation in the region, with a goal to have 50 million hectares under restoration by 2030, A and R has proven to be a powerful approach. For example, the efforts at Valle Chacabuco in Chile by Conservación Patagónica to restore close to 230,000 hectares through ecological restoration, and at Esteros de Libera in Argentina by rewilding Argentina on over 100,000 hectares, have illustrated that large areas can successfully be restored using nature as an ally with a little bit of help from its friends. These and other projects give us hope that A and R can be successfully deployed at scale. I invite you to now participate in the launch of this report and to continue your engagement in the restoration movement in the region, a movement that needs you so that it can contribute to address the climate, biodiversity and water crisis. Welcome again, we're very pleased by your involvement. Muito obrigada, Walter. Thank you so much, Walter. So back to me and moving on with our uh, initial remarks, our colleague Andrea Pinto, who is a researcher from Amazon and who's been supporting us. I'd like to thank you so much for being here on behalf of WRI and the whole project team. So please, you can start with your initial remarks. You have three minutes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so it's a great satisfaction to be here today when we finalize the systemization of many successful cases on applying the assisted natural regeneration as a cheaper option for forest restoration all over the world. So as it's being said, I am a researcher at Amazon, the Brazilian Institute of Research. It's a nonprofit organization that has been working for 32 years in the Amazon area, especially in the Brazilian Amazon. Some recent studies, many of them supported here at the level of the project, they show that of course, there's a huge potential of secondary vegetations in the Amazon biome. And we try to qualify and characterize this secondary vegetation, considering the age and the time of permanence where they are, and considering their location in terms of classes and in terms of agricultural uh, aptness. So uh, we see here that maybe you might know some names like as uh, some numbers like 3 million hectares in restoration of secondary vegetation in the biome. Some of them talk about 16 million hectares of secondary vegetation, but we try to see the age ranges. For instance, uh, by excluding the first five years of the secondary vegetation, meaning this secondary vegetation that is in the resting phase, but has uh, gone beyond the one that are more than six years, we find 7,200,000 hectares of secondary vegetation in the Amazon biome. So we try to know from this total, the 7,800,000 that are at least six years old, how many of them are competing with the agriculture, grain agriculture in areas that are low or high uh, agricultural aptness. And then we found out that 5,200,000 hectares of secondary vegetation here in the Amazon biome is an area of low agricultural aptness. So when we ask ourselves, we know that the idea of generating information is to support the implementation of public policies. And we have to have a work plan on where to start off. So you bring in this suggestion by looking at the secondary vegetation and the Amazon biome with this 5,800,000 and 200,000, they are in low agricultural aptness. So we try to see where they are. 44% approximately, they happen in the state of Pará, in the eastern part of Amazon, in the state of Mato Grosso as well, that stands out in the state of Amazon. So we have to look at this and leverage uh, nature working for uh, forest recovery and take the necessary measure, measures. Because yes, the numbers are interesting, they're positive, they make us hopeful with the recovery and a possibility to follow the national international goals, as well as keep up with the law, uh, the forestry code in Brazil. But a significant part of this area is invisible. 
it is not captured in the official systems. It's not really part of a program of environmental regulation. So as a recommendation, once they're mapped uh, with this great potential that is very favorable to all of us in the area, in the country, and to the whole world, considering the capacity to retain carbon, for instance, what do we have? We have to move on, move on with the implementation of the forestry code, because 21% of this vegetation that I mentioned with low agricultural potential is in private land uh, that where people have the land entitlement. 15% of our rural settlements and the other 20% are in public areas, but are not destined to anything. And 19% are in protected areas that are also public land. So by looking at it, we have this map or filtering down where we have no, not much pressure that help us guide us on how we can leverage that and use this area that can help us deliver important numbers as well as bring in a general ecosystem benefit. So that's what I had to say. Thank you so much. And we're going to see concrete cases specifically. We have two cases of uh, rural areas uh, that by using natural regeneration, they managed to reach the, the numbers they needed. Thank you so much. Awesome. Andrea, thank you so much because it's all about that. It's not only about understanding the how much assistant or, or how assisted uh, the differences in techniques, but how the agenda integrates with many others that are absolutely key and essential for us to move on with environmental regulation through uh, forest conservation. Alice, uh, who is the executive director for ICV, tell us a little more about the ICV Mato Grosso perspective in our initial remarks. Thank you, Alice. Alice, you have three minutes. Thank you, Fabiola. Good morning, everyone. I believe I'll start off by congratulating WRI for the initiative. It's very important to talk about assisted natural regeneration because it's a much cheaper and affordable and simpler technique. And we are at a moment in Brazil or in the state of Mato Grosso or even here in the city of Alta Floresta where we really need to simplify environmental regulation, simplifying by introducing and talking more about the techniques and also the, the, RN, the ANR. So I'm Alice, I'm the executive director for ICE, ICV and I have the honor to represent the ICV team which uh, has the technical role of testing and monitoring the, we have 50 uh, properties uh, that we work uh, with this project and the work uh, has a dialogue with our mission, which is to build shared solutions to use land and natural research, the researchers, I mean, of course, the resources, and of course, the uh, sustainable way of using it. And we do that in the state of Mato Grosso because the state has the advantage of concentrating these challenges. It's kind of laboratory for everything that's going on. But besides that, it's also a state where there's the, the political willingness or intention to implement a low carbon agriculture. So I'm talking about that because in the solutions, putting that in a more general case on the effort to try to fit things. And like Walter said, uh, to face the crisis that our generation is facing, which is about the climate changes. So this strategy in the state of Mato Grosso, and Ricardo may say more about that, he's going to explain more about that, but it's got the ambition to reduce the emissions of six gigatons of carbon. And it's very clear if we do not have here in Brazil, an environmental regulation that is well done, we won't be able to do the mitigation and the contribution uh, to reduce, uh, to mitigate climate change. So in the state of Mato Grosso, the environmental regulation, the size of the task is to regulate over 100,000 uh, properties. In the recovery and regeneration uh, terms, uh, it, let, several numbers have been mentioned. Our numbers are not always the same, but it's from two to four million hectares that 
can uh, be regenerated in areas of legal reserves. So in order to do that, we need techniques that are efficient, uh, we have, which have their efficiency proved, proven. So I think it is key for us to right now have all the content and the proofs and the material uh, to get that in practice and also to move on on the legal definitions because clear in the state of Mato Grosso, when we put this uh, pressure that we want to work on it, we also need a legal framework of the definitions uh, that we need of what uh, uh, RNA is, of what ANR is and how it can be considered as a monitoring system that is very clear, very solid. So, and then we need a technical assistant that goes in that direction. Anyways, uh, to wrap up uh, my initial remarks, the material that will be released today is really important right now. And I would say that you can count on us in this agenda because it really has a very promising future. Thank you so much, Alice. It's really about this connection between the public and private that we know that already. Uh, and this is an effective agenda that can actually unlock many of the processes that I believe today we still have felt some hurdles and the state of Mato Grosso is definitely one with a very favorable ambience uh, for us to try that in a more solid and consolidated way from now on. So thank you so much. And talking about the private sector, we bring in Marcelo Pereira, who is the manager of sustainability of Susano company. So Marcelo, share us, share with us some of the perspective of the private sector, as well as the industry, wood industry and Susano and how ANR can collaborate and has been collaborating with the agenda that you lead. Thank you so much. You have three minutes. Thank you, Fabiola. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Susana, Susano, once again, I thank you, WRI, for inviting us. Uh, I say hello to all participants who are with us in many places of the world at the same time. It's very gratifying for Susana to take part of such initiative. It's a very relevant theme for the planet, which is the ecosystem uh, restoration and focus on the methodology that has a huge potential to contribute, which is the challenge of the scale on the restoration that we mentioned so much today. Susano today has 2.4 million hectares of forests. Out of the 2.4, approximately 1 million hectares is dedicated for environmental conservation. And along the last 10 years of experience, we have accumulated a lot of experience in uh, the execution, implementation, and during this time, we put another 30,000 hectares on the ground, especially in the Atlantic uh, forest. And some 30% of this number happened through some sort of natural, uh, assisted natural regeneration uh, method. As it's been said, we're helping nature play its role is a method with very little intervention and a very high success rate. So in our program today, it's a very solid and consistent methodology, and we always use it whenever it's possible to be performed. And taking part of such initiative with WRI and the other partners for us is really key because we believe that as we contribute to the development and improvement, improvement of the ANR methodologies, we are certainly going to enable more players to engage in a general way uh, to the restoration uh, change so it's very important for us to have uh, like uh, poverty eradication and especially the most recent uh, uh, commitments that are related to biodiversity we have committed to up to 2030 to connect half a million hectares of priority areas for conservation in the three biomes where we work uh, which is amazon cerrado and atlantic forest and that was the way that we, as a private sector, we decided to improve our restoration, uh, looking outside of our borders, outside our gates, uh, the gates of our farms, by looking at the landscape as a whole and looking for some contribution for that. So we are absolutely aware that we are not going to reach our, the, all those goals all alone. So being part of such initiative here is absolutely key because it gets that 
practical knowledge that is developed and applied, taking it to the field, transferring the technology to the field, which is actually, this is going to generate value and promote the necessary transformations for the society. And that's what the society wants. So do count on us to keep the journey on developing ANR. Thank you so much. I hope you all have a great event. Excellent, Marcelo. Thank you so much. It's about that, right? How can we internalize these practices for forest regeneration and in a special ANR as a business practice, right? Not only for this vertical, but for all the economic verticals. We need to understand that we need to protect our forests and that is crucial for business, right? So now let's move towards the second moment of our meeting, a moment in which we will effectively launch our publication. And before handing over, I would like to highlight some of the authors and both two of them. So Julio Alves, Mariana Oliveira, Robert Chaston, Daniel Calmon, Andrea Pinto, Eduardo Davin e Bruna Pereira. We want to deeply thank all of you and congratulate you for the amazing work being launched today. For us to understand this concept in depth, we bring to you, I believe, the biggest specialist in the world on the topic, Robin, who will tell us all about the most advanced aspects on the topic. Robin, thank you so much. And if you could please share your knowledge in 10 minutes with us. Yes, thank you very much, Fabiola, and welcome to all of you from uh, visiting from all over the world. I'm going to present uh, a very brief introduction to what is assisted natural regeneration um, and give you a bit of the, the evidence behind why this is such an important uh, method for, for restoration. So we call this the ABCs. And uh, first, I would like to go ahead to the next slide, please. When we talk about natural regeneration, what do we really mean? So this is a process of reestablishment of a native forest ecosystem that happens after a disturbance. It could be a human disturbance. It could be natural disturbance or combination. This is a long-term process where the forest is uh, rebuilding itself uh, used across different stages. And each of these stages have different dynamics and they have different species that play important roles. And the outcomes of this process, because they're very contingent on a sequence of events can vary, can vary a lot um, over space as well as over time. And we've learned that um, it, this process can happen on its own without any human intervention, but it can also be assisted in particular ways. And through that assistance, we can also manage these ecosystems for different objectives. Next, please. So um, from many perspectives, this natural regeneration process appears very slow. And that is because these stages are happening over time and, and the composition changes as you get a turning over of species. Um, and it's often very overlooked um, and underappreciated as people tend to view this as, as sort of weedy vegetation or, or wasteland because it came up in areas that were abandoned, nobody is caring for it. These areas are very vulnerable for these reasons to being recleared. Um, and often they're not really understood um, as being the young forests and the potential forests that they could become. Next slide. So we want to help this process happen. We want to help nature recover using its own potential, but accelerating it or modifying it in ways to improve the process and to make it more beneficial for local people. So in many ways, this is a middle ground between a completely passive or led by nature approach to one that is um, tightly controlled through, through planting trees. And that is why we call it assisted natural regeneration. And it's a very appropriate approach for reaching the scale that we need. Next slide. So this looks like a beautiful forest and it is. It's a 30 year old secondary forest that was uh, formerly a pasture 
This is in northeastern Costa Rica. I have watched this, this forest grow since it was a pasture, and uh, we've been studying in great detail all of the changes here. Clearly, this approach is the best way to restore forests from an ecological perspective, because you're getting all of the biodiversity coming back to the area, and you're achieving multiple goals, including carbon storage, water regulation, um, and products, uh, both wood, timber, and non-timber products that can be used. Next slide. It doesn't always happen so quickly. This is in the front range of Colorado, near where I live. And this area had a forest fire in the year 2000 and has been slowly recovering. Uh, this is good recovery, but it's 20 years. It's very slow in this kind of ecosystem. Uh, but the trees are definitely coming back and all of the shrubs and the wildlife are, are returning to this area. But it takes time. Next slide. Uh, so because these rates of, of forest regrowth are so affected by climate as well as other types of factors, um, we see a huge variation across the world. In fact, there's a 100 fold amount of, of variation in the rate of carbon storage in above ground vegetation during the first 30 years of forest regrowth, as we've studied a compiled data from around the world in this graph. The areas in the dark green are the, those ecosystems where forest recovery stores the largest amounts of carbon, up to six megagrams per hectare per year. Um, and the next slide, shows just those areas where forests have been removed or cleared. Um, and we can see where we can maximize the potential for carbon storage just using the natural regeneration process as it occurs in those regions. And I wanna highlight the huge potential in uh, the Latin American region and in, in the Atlantic forests of Brazil, the Amazon, regions that have been deforested and uh, Central America as areas where we have very, very high rates of carbon storage during the 30 years, first 30 years of forest regeneration. Next slide. But it doesn't always happen ideally. There are obstacles that get in the way of, of letting the forest do its own recovery. Um, and you can see here, we have areas of soil erosion, uh, we have very patchy tree cover, which is actually good uh, for regeneration, but we have cows that are, that are present in the landscape. Next slide. So if we want to encourage sites to, to regenerate naturally, what can we do? There are many different approaches that can be used and these have to be tailored to the specific site conditions. The first is simply protecting the remaining vegetation and just letting it regrow without further intervention. Um, the second is to keep fire out of areas where the forests are beginning to regenerate. During these very early stages, fire can be very damaging and prevent the trees from establishing. We can also enrich the, the area by planting particular species that are, are missing from the regeneration or that have particular ecological or economic importance. Uh, and we need to learn how do we can manage cattle better. In some cases, um, some grazing animals can actually help uh, prevent weeds from uh, competing with trees and do help the, the initial process to go better. Um, for the same reason, we need to control invasive species uh, by individually removing them or by using herbicides very selectively. Um, also, we can control insects and, and ants, for example, that are eating young seedlings and um, making it very difficult for, for woody vegetation to become reestablished. And we can fence off areas uh, to prevent overgrazing or trampling of the vegetation by cattle. Next slide. This approach that we call assisted natural regeneration is among the lowest, it is the lowest cost approach to forest restoration, um, but it has extremely high benefits for biodiversity. And this is why it has the potential for really reaching the scale that we need. 
Um, and although it may not immediately have the economic potential, for example, that a commercial large scale reforestation project would have, um, or even agroforestry, um, the economic potential could grow over time and uh, being able to restore the native vegetation uh, can be extremely important for local farmers as well as uh, for the water supply for local people. So it, it can it, the payoff in these services can be very high. Next slide. So among the benefits that we see, we have uh, high rates of carbon storage um, and we have the biodiversity impacts that are coming back and the, the low cost. We can reduce the cost of restoration up to 77% as we showed during in the Atlantic forest by applying assisted natural regeneration under in suitable areas compared to the costs of full tree planting. And uh, this, this highlights the importance of identifying those areas that do have a high potential for natural regeneration and for where assistance can, can really make a difference. Um, and those areas should not be targeted for full scale tree planting. Next slide. Um, so how do we make this successful? Um, we certainly need to have strong motivation. We need to have a set of enabling conditions and we need to have assistance with implementation. Um, and that is different from the kind of assistance we have with implementing uh, large scale tree plantations, because uh, we need to have a, a shift in the or, orientation of, of technological services and technical assistance and rural extension. Enabling conditions require having the right kind of ecological conditions present, um, being able to establish sustainable value chains and also fostering the political will across the landscape to embrace these areas, sometimes very small areas of natural regeneration that, that could be enlarged and could be linked in the landscape. Next slide. We have examples around the world um, in the uh, report uh, that highlight cases around the world. Uh, we include this case in the Philippines where ANR uh, initially became very important in the 1970s and starts out with controlling these invasive grasses, the imperata grass, where you have naturally regenerating tree seedlings and we give them a chance to grow. And then the fire breaks are also put in to prevent uh, fires and to also permit agroforestry. Next slide, I'm finishing up. Just to, just to um, emphasize that the global potential for ANR is enormous. Um, this map shows the percentage of forest gain during uh, the beginning of this century, the proportion that was natural regeneration as opposed to tree planting. Then green, the, the largest, the darkest green, those areas um, showed that when there was forest gain, it was almost all natural regeneration. Um, in the orange, it was almost all tree plantings. Uh, this potential has been quantified and we're also using this information to predict what were the conditions where this happened and how we can we predict where natural regeneration will be a good option for the future. Um, next slide. So thank you very much. Uh, and I, I hope you learned something and I hope uh, that we can, we can all continue learning together. Thank you. Muito obrigada, Robin. Muito a aprender, né? Mas também a gente viu já muitos acúmulos, né? Em termos Thank you de... so much, Robin. We have so much yet to learn, but we already can see so much improvement in terms of um, regrowth and also monitoring. We need to learn about that to make better decisions and move forward. Quickly, I would like to hand over to my colleague, Julio Alves. He is a research analyst and he will tell us a little bit about how this whole concept that Robin brought us is now echoing in practice, in real life, in some Brazilian sites and around the world. Julio, five minutes, please. Thank you, Fabiola. Thank you, Robin. Can you please share my slides? Thank you. 
dia, boa tarde, boa noite a todos. Obrigado pela presença de vocês. É, durante o último ano... Well, good morning, afternoon and evening to all of you. In the last year, we had this challenge of amassing all this data and analyzing them, areas that already had ANR inside their restoration techniques. This demand came from Mato Grosso and Pará and WRI partnership. And to promote and implement ANR, we needed to understand how it ha happens in the field. For that, we brought together 24 cases of ANR 15 in Brazil and nine in other countries. And we put it all together in the publication, The Role of Assisted Natural Regeneration in Accelerating Forest and Landscape Restoration. Publication is also available in Spanish and French. The objectives of this publication were to compile and publicize cases of ANR, to provide information around these projects, highlighting the factors that led to successful ANR in the field, and with that, to inspire more people and companies and businesses to include ANR to accelerate and scale up the restoring of the lands in Brazil and in the world. Here we have the geographical distribution of the cases in our publication. And it's not at random that it matches the map that Robin showed us with the potential for natural regeneration. So many of them, majority of them are located in the Atlantic forest and the majority of them in the tropical and subtropical regions in the special humid forests and savanna biomes. Amongst all the content of the publication, I'd like to highlight section four, opportunities and challenges to expand ANR. In this chapter, we analyze the cases according to their ecosystem biome, the use of the land and the type of INR that was applied, profile and size of the areas, people and organizations that were engaged. These informations, they were amassed together on table one, it is a synthesis. So we have project, the type, of interventions that were promoted in the areas. This is an example of our first case, but we have, we did the same for all the other 23 cases. Stories in detail with the context can be found in the Appendix A. In Brazil, we have the growing hub, hope, the case from Mother Natura, but this is just the one case to use as an example. We have the same for the 24 cases in detail in this appendix. After this analysis of all the cases, we have some key findings that give us a north how to adopt RNA or ANR pardon, for the regeneration of lands. First, ENR is an effective low cost technique to recover these areas, legal reserves and also APPs. The private sector is a key actor. Many of the initiatives happen in private areas belonging to companies. So we had the investment of the private sector to use ANR as a technique. ANR has also assured the maintenance of ecosystem services provision in many cases, and especially the water supply and the soil fertility. And all of that because all of, all of the processes, they should, they may, and they should be linked to income generation via wood product or forestry economy. 
In that sense, we believe that these cases may inspire and improve other initiatives of ANR around the world. ANR is very pliable and can be adapted to different contexts. And um, it needs to be in a set of a engaged community and um, it is critical to really maintain native species and improve the the landscape publication may be found in english spanish and french as well as in portuguese you have the links there and that's it thanks so much for your attention thank you julio So first of all, I'd like to tell you that now we have all the languages available for interpretation. We apologize for the inconvenience in the very beginning, but now all languages are available for simultaneous interpretation. We'll be starting our panel, which is the third part of our agenda. So without further ado, I believe the most important thing in the panel is because we bring together a set of very different perspectives and altogether they need to be necessary. To think of the global and subnational scales in case of Para and Mato Grosso that will be represented in our panel. So I will start with a video, and the panel will be a mix of videos, which are the cases that are on the publication available for download by all of you, as you can see on the link sent by the chat, as well as the colleagues who are experts in the restoration agenda. And as I said, from many different perspectives, from global to local. They are going to share their experiences and lessons, share with us so that we can feed uh, our thoughts on how we can do to advance better. We're going to start with a video that shows the Parque das Neblinas, the fog park, and how uh, assisted regeneration has been contributing with the ecosystem of the area. So let's watch the video. Hi, I'm Michele Martins. I'm a biologist, sustainability analyst for the Ecuador Institute. I'm here today to share with you all the Parque das Neblinas, the Fog Park project, one of the longest and most successful projects. In the 1940s and 1950s, the steel industry has started to call the entire Atlantic forest where we call Parque das Neblinas nowadays, the Fog Park. And the steel company that used to own uh, the property, they planted eucalyptus for the same goal. At at the end of the 1960s, uh, we they we acquired these areas to keep uh, planting and managing eucalyptus to produce cellulose. That was bought by the Susano Company. 1988, Susano created it, uh, its forest environment area, and the first step of this recently created department was to put together techniques to minimize environmental impact. Then the area went through an assisted regeneration process especially because there's a state park and the natural regeneration process happens in a very generous way as we have the neighbors, the largest athletic forest continues in Brazil. Of course, the climate conditions in the area, the offer of water and the management of the unit also contribute uh, for the regeneration, which is currently one of the private areas with the largest number of species in the Atlantic forest biome, with 1,265 species registered in the area, amongst them four are new species for science, and we also protect 530 different springs that contribute to the making of the main rivers in the area, like the Itatiba River. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's a private conservation unit, and we know that the different ways the private sector, the financial sector, can effectively engage on the protection for forests are very diverse. And I'll have my colleague, who's the leader of innovation of a platform called 133, uh, which is hosted by the World Economic Forum. So you have three minutes now to share with us, Florian, and how we can effectively advance on the scale through an investment that is solid and continues from the private sector. And what are the challenges and opportunities so that we can effectively increase the flow 
and better organize and apply those investments in the restoration agenda and AN, uh, in uh, ANR specifically. Thank you, Florian. Thank you so much, uh, Fabiola and colleagues, and um, for the invitation. Um, it's great to be here with all of you and seeing um, so many interested participants um, learning, interested in learning more about um, ANR. And congratulations on the launch of this important uh, report. Um, I think, as we have uh, as we have heard, so many really important reasons for many more stakeholders that are not um, restoration experts to really know about uh, of the benefits of ANR. And uh, Robin, thank you so much for uh, having laid it out so clearly before. Um, as Fabiola has mentioned, um, I uh, today represent the One T.org initiative, um, which is hosted at the World Economic Forum. Um, set up in support of the UN Decade on Ecosystem um, Restoration. And um, we do provide a platform to help mobilize the private sector to invest in the conservation, restoration and growth um, of forests. And um, I think one, the first observation that I would like to share with you is that um, you know, we observe that there is increased commitment and interest in the private sector to do the right thing right. It is a learning journey, um, but there is increased interest in the private sector from across the sectors, which I think is quite interesting to, to observe, um, including as a result, of course, of the need to transition towards a net zero, um, including um, as required by science, first of all, of course. Um, there is really also that interest in like good carbon removals that come with a lot of um, biodiversity benefits. So. That interest in net zero has really, um, I think, triggered a lot of um, interest in, in restoration. And um, so over the last year or so, you know, we've been um, starting to convene a corporate alliance of companies that registered their pledges with OneT.org. So far, it's just over 30. Um, but, so there is room for many, many more companies to join us. Uh, Susano, for example, is one of the um, more leading companies uh, in our alliance. Um, and out of those roughly 30, companies, just half of them actually have also included specifically ANR in their commitment for the conservation and restoration of forests. Um, so that's, um, I think we're quite happy with that. It's, you can say it's 50% that also uh, uh, create, leaves room for more, but there is interest. Um, and then I think um, no, how to translate that interest into actually actions on the ground. Uh, another, and maybe that's a second observation, is that you know, carbon markets obviously do play a very important role. Not the only role, but a very important role. Um, there has been in almost unprecedented momentum in carbon markets recently, has surpassed um, a billion in volume, um, billion USD recently, projected to continue to grow 15 fold by 2030. That growth obviously has to be delivered in a high integrity manner. Um, and um, Companies who want to invest in carbon credits, including uh, projects that have ANR and its basis, one of the key questions for this to happen is also how the entire accounting system and monitoring system is actually set up. And I think we've also started to talk about that, but I think that's one of the key enablers. It can be a hurdle and it can be a huge enabler if done right. I mean, if the MRV systems, the accounting systems, um, include, enable, basically enable companies to also account for activities such as ANR that happen at the landscape level, not necessarily only at the farm level. Um, it has the potential to increase more investment um, from via the carbon markets. At the same time, as we spoke about uh, non timber forest products, um, harnessing that uh, growing demand for you know, um, good, healthy, natural products, those bioeconomy value chains, um, there is something there to be truly developed, uh, planting uh, or like letting uh, trees grow on previously degraded land, so coupling A&R with productive um, tree value chains that meet the needs of consumers that increasingly look for um, healthy products. I think that's another opportunity also for the private sector. And maybe last but not least, um, well, that's for a different type of private sector stakeholders, but it's the investment in the startups um, that are making all of those shifts happen. Um, I mean, last year, Larry Fink of BlackRock said the 
next 1,000 unicorns will be climate um, startups. Um, a part of those climate startups will be startups that put the restoration of nature at the heart of their business model. Um, so there is an emerging field of startups that uh, are engaging in that field, and that creates opportunities for, um, no, not necessarily um, a, you know, it actually creates opportunities for certain investors, right, to really want to support that type of um, company. So I think um, that's a really important um, opportunity as well. But I think the one element I would really like to highlight is the alignment of the you know, standards and accounting systems to make sure that activities that happen beyond the farm level, which often um, includes a &R, can actually really be included in all those systems. Thank you very much. Thank you. Obrigada, Florian. Obrigada mesmo. Thank you, Florian. Thank you so much for your participation. I believe this alignment of the carbon restoration agenda and environmental services, as well as following an integrated monitoring system, will be a major maverick of these resources because including the support so that we can translate the commitments that are announced and already being implemented and turn that into a concrete reality. And it's a learning journey, as we say. We are learning and we hope to count on all of you and all of the companies that are committed to us and also to so many others so that we can effectively, effectively turn that into reality. So we now go from a global context and moving into a, an experience of our brother continent, Africa. And it's not only in the Southern hemisphere, but also in the forest countries, countries that have forest space and what's happening effectively in Africa. So before we go there, before we go to Bernadette, who's going to share a little bit of the experience in the African continent, we'd like to share one more video with you, which is a video of the environmentalist association called Copaiba, and then I'll give the floor to Bernadette. We're going to listen to her after the video. The Rio do Peixe project. I'm Flavia Baldieri. I'm an executive of Copaiba. Copaiba has been using techniques uh, as a way to work on the total area of our restoration projects that happen here in the Rio do Peixe Basin and the Kamandukaya River Basin. And that was a way that we found to leverage the forest assets that we have here in our area. So here we have the benefits uh, for the area uh, with uh, water spring, uh, where we can bring all the benefits uh, to the surroundings, learn about the success cases on ANR at wrbrazil.org.br slash RNA. Muito obrigada. Acho que agora, né, inclusive até Thank you so much. I guess that Q&A, né, sobre esse Q&A about effectively how this project on ANR uh how we can help uh, help uh on the management of land but also on the management of regula regulating environmental and the use of forests and that's quite a, a timely to hear our colleague, uh, Bernadette Arakiwi, who is going to bring us the lessons that we can learn uh, from our African continent regarding the assisted uh, natural regeneration based on some effective events of projects and their benefits to the local communities, as well as the benefits so that we can effectively reach the African continent and their restoration goals that are also quite ambitious. So Bernadette, we have three minutes, please. Thank you so much, uh, Fabiola. Those videos were wonderful. Uh, first of all, we are really excited to be participating in this conversation about assisted natural regeneration and to hear about the successes of this restoration technique in Brazil and, and elsewhere. This is really an excellent opportunity for deepening south-south exchanges, which is going to help us 
on the African continent pull a few lessons and successes that we can then apply and replicate on the African continent. This being said, um, the assisted natural regeneration is not really new on the African continent. Its history dates back to early 1980s, and I will be sharing a key takeaways on ANR in Africa as I answer your question, Fabiola. Really the first lesson or key takeaway that I want to share about Africa and INR is about the power of having successful cases demonstrated on the ground. The one well-documented ANR case in Africa is about the farmer managed natural regeneration, which was initiated in Niger in early 1980s. And all the stories we about uh, this FMNR technique really stresses how this land management or restoration technique spread across communities through farmers that were experiencing and witnessing the benefits of land restoration, whether in terms of improved land productivity, improved access to wood and non-wood product from restored trees on farms. And here it is also worth mentioning the, the low cost, which came up uh, multiple times in this webinar, the low cost of this technique and the fact that farmers are going to rely less on external factors such as seedling supply in order to implement this technique on the ground. So really interesting to read about those uh, success stories from Niger and other countries uh, in the Sahel region. And secondly, um, I want to share that uh, we are also beginning to have successful cases on where ANR is helping recover natural ecosystem. And I'm mentioning this again because so many examples from the African continent have been about croplands or grazing lands. And now I want to share one example in uh, Western Rwanda, my country, which became first known for its severe degradation that was worsening floodings, landslides, and other environmental catastrophes. So multiple actors, including national government, local government, as well as local communities, they worked together to remove the barriers to natural regeneration in Gishwati landscape. Um, and these uh, disturbances were mostly from cattle that were grazing on the natural forest was about illegal cutting of trees, which um, and by removing these barriers, uh, it really allowed the forest to return to the ecosystem. Studies that did uh, the evaluation of this restoration technique have shown that the restored forest have biodiversity species comparable to the natural forest found in the same uh, region. And this has happened in less than 10 years. So I'm sharing these two examples, but we are really also aware that there is a need to have a more comprehensive understanding of assisted natural regeneration and all its variation on the African continent. Early today, I was reading about ANR in Africa, and I read about assisted natural regeneration during weeding. This is a new technique that is being applied to Central African Republic. There's a publication about this that I will gladly share. And, um, it's really uh, important to also provide to the actors on the ground detailed guidance on where this ANR is possible. Uh, Robin and others have shared maps of this ANR potential in different places. I would add that there is a need to really provide that information all the way to the actors on the ground so that they can take advantage of this low cost restoration technique. And this comprehensive stock take, once we do it, uh, it's going to also allow us to better assess how assisted uh, natural regeneration is contributing to the large scale restoration goals on the African continent, such as the FR100 or the Great, Great Green Wall. So I want to stop here and I will be happy to answer any other questions that come up. Thank you, Fabiola. Thank you so much, Bernadette. So much to share. Desculpe. <laughs> Tanto a compartilhar e tanto Thank you so much. We've got so much to share and effectively build together this cooperation so we are now going to land back to brazil and before introducing my next colleague on the panel we are going to watch one more video which is in the state of para then i'll have raul who is the deputy secretary of my environment in para so we are somehow landing here in one of the we have a project of continuity in this video specifically of the Asuncena farm in Rio Preto. So let's watch the video and then we we'll go back to Rome.
Olá, eu sou Andrea Pinto, pesquisadora. Olá, eu sou Andrea Pinto, researcher at Amazon. I'm in an area of natural regeneration in the state of Pará. This area has a vegetation over five years old, and our studies show that the Amazon biome has at least 7.2 million hectares of this type of area. And an expressive substantial part of these 75%, 5.2 million are areas of low agricultural aptitude. So ANR is an excellent option for the rural producer. It has the lowest cost. You don't need to buy seedlings. You just remove degradation factors and allow the vegetation to regrow. And this allows you to settle liabilities if you have a forest deficit in your legal reserve or a permanent preservation area. Here we have two farms, one of them in 12 years from 2008 to 2020 increased its natural generation within legal reserve by 11 fold and settle its liabilities. And then we have another success story, same municipality achieved 60% increase in its natural regeneration area. The Paragomina city as a whole in the 12 years had a 40% gain in areas recovering with natural regeneration. Obrigada, já vimos a Andrea hoje aqui, né? Mais Thank uma... you. We've seen Andrea today before thank you so much for your case now how how protasio is the environment secretary for the para state how i believe that from this case that andrea introduced to us but also from the whole ambitious project of the Amazonia Agora, the Para Stage program. Well, we know that many of the challenges that we've talked about, you face on a daily basis. So in the current state of the program and all the legislation, what's being done to advance the agenda, how do you see ANR? as an element to help unlock or surpass some of the obstacles that are still very challenging. Tell us a little bit about it, the Amazon and the Paras reality. Thank you, Fabiola. Thank you for the invitation. I wish you all a good day. And I will try to give you my brief contribution on how governments may help in the regeneration process that has been underscored how important it is for the ecosystem. Let me tell you a little bit about the government role in all of that. First of all, Annalise talked about it is that we need the, the climate policies must be in the center of the government to really increase and nurture the political will. If we do not have a high level political will, then the projects would will be of a smaller scale. We won't be able to surpass the obstacles. And how? to achieve the political will, this is another matter. In the Parai state, we have overcame that barrier. We have a great political will from our governor. Then once you have the political will of uh, have a climate centric public management, then you need a strategic practical plan to identify the root causes of the problem and to properly tackle them. And the Para State, we built the Amazon Now Amazonia Agora project to reduce carbon emissions. Our goal is to be carbon neutral, neutral by 2037. 
and we can achieve that by reducing reforestation and by aggressively increasing restoration. Our target is of 5.6 million hectares till 2036, which is 40 percent of the Brazilian commitment in the Paris Agreement. And that is very ambitious. I agree with that. And it couldn't be otherwise, because simply fulfilling, merely fulfilling the legislation, the forestry code, will lead us to achieve this number. It's self-declared. We have some elements that are not so safe regarding the numbers, but it is around five to seven million hectares. So if you simply are compliant to the law, to the legislation, you will reach the goal. Deforestation after 2008 that is the, the one that is not needed for restoration. We are talking about 5.2 million hectares of illegal, illegal um, actions after 2008. So you have a clear political will, clear goals. Then you can move forward. Now talking about the Parai state, we have our annual restoration plan and we have launched this plan because we believe that a well-established plan can optimize public efforts it can help ident identi identify those areas of great aptness priority areas can identify opportunities for the private sector to be engaged and as Marcelo from Susano said, without public private sector, there's no way we will not do it. So the plan helps us to identify adequate areas and adequate public private arrangements. So from that, we think about tools to repay the environmental projects. The carbon market helps with that the programs for a sustainable agro-development that focus on um, areas that are already legally anthropized that help us not only with deforestation, but also aligned with a robust plan that help us to think about regenerating some areas. The opportunity cost for cattle rancher is it's now in the past. Now with the recovery, the regeneration does give us greater room for profit in the future. All of that asks for a land intelligence platform to measure results, to monitor the advances and to properly identify what sites and what is being more concrete from the diagnosis, from the actions of our plan, all of that, what is being put in practice in a concrete way. Now, talking about ANR, when you have such a big goal, we cannot think that the just NR just the passive regeneration will suffice. We need to assist it, to really reach our goal. For a family agriculture, smaller properties, we have other strategies, middle private properties, other strategies. It's all tailored, but all of that starts with a clear diagnosis and an adequate plan. I tried to speed up and to cover everything. I'd like to thank you all again for the opportunity. Oh, excellent, yeah, that's... That's what it's all about, right? How, how can we effectively, just by fulfilling the legislation, and in Brazilian case, is a huge advance, 
And how can we go beyond that? What would be this platform for economic incentive? And where, what is the role of ANR to really align all of that? Thank you, Raul and Count on us to, for the national policies to internalize ANR and for us to effectively see practical cases in the field as we saw with Andreas case. Now we are going to leave Pará and move to another important state in the Brazilian Amazon and also has other biomes, Cerrado, for example, which is the Brazilian savanna. And we'll start with a video, a video of um, productive chains. So from the state of Mato Grosso, this was led by the ICV. Hi, I'm Eduardo Darwin. I am the social business program coordinator for the Life Center Institute. ANR is one of the strategies that we use in our projects to recover and restore degraded areas inside family agriculture properties that the ones that we support. ANR is extremely important. It is a highly effective strategy. One of the obstacles that we have for forest regeneration is the budget, right? It requires an investment to recover an area. And the natural regeneration has a huge impact, mainly from the economic point of view, because it is a low cost implementation. Besides, it brings all the environmental and financial benefits for the property. When you recover an area, a degraded area, you will have better water flow in the rivers. So you will have water for irrigation, for the family consumption. You will have water for animals, for the animals as well. We see that in some properties already happening. Okay, excellent. So now I give the floor to Ricardo Udmor, who is the project manager for PCI, Produce, Conserve and Implement, project from the Mato Grosso State. So with you, Ricardo. Hi, it's a pleasure to meet you all virtually. My name is Ricardo Voldemort. I am the project manager for the PCI Institute in the state of Mato Grosso. So let me tell you a little bit about our institute and how today's topic relates to our strategy. Well, our institute has a legal jurisdictional strategy that brings together public private and third, third sector actors with goals up to 2030 for the protection, conservation, production, conservation and inclusion. This strategy has been presented at the COP20 in Paris, and it brings some important topics such as the ANR, we have a goal of keeping 60% of the native covered, the native vegetation of Mato Grosso. And we have an indicator of secondary forests as well. So we monitor the, the goals since 2015 and 2019, we had 4.04% according to map biomes. Talking specifically about environment regularization, we have some specific goals. First, we would like to register 90% of the properties by 2024-14. Currently, we have 150,000 or 60% of the lands registered. We would like to register these till 2024 and we already have 41 percent of the registerable area already analyzed from that 25.7 percent of the registries have been finalized and validated our goal is to 
recover part of this area to in 2020 we had 1152 hectares already analyzed and we have estimated the investment needed to reach our goals we are thinking about 31 billion reais So we are thinking about 5,400 as an average cost per hectare, and that will be obtained via the Haddam project. So we want to regularize 5.8 million hectares, which would be 100% of our legal areas by 2030. So we already had a percentage of these um, hack degraded areas with a um, contract signed and we invested 59 billion reais. Taking into account the ambition of our goals and the costs, ANR is a extremely important strategy for the Mato Grosso actors. There is another very interesting project, the update of the Pitch Book PCI 2019, together with TFA and via the Corporate Action Group, the PCI launched the Pit Pool, it is a portfolio of 12 financiable projects. And we aim to get the finances to reach the scale and to help implement our goals. 2021, the PCI Institute expanded this effort. And in May 2021 as well, in a partnership with um, TDH, we will launch an updated version of our pitch book with 37 projects. Of them, 10 projects are about forestry regeneration and they will likely consider ANR. Some of the projects that we highlight is to have a JBS green office. We have projects involving, involving TIC and Amigos da Terra. We have a project of uh, the Araguaia Valley in Mato Grosso for regeneration regenerative agriculture and cattle, so agroforestry. We have the socio-productive networks, the agroforestry project from Querencia Institute in Unicaps. We have a project involving Bajado gases within the Araguaia watershed basin. We have a project by Quads as well, diversity and network from the Shingu network and some others. I'm, I went over time, I'm so sorry, but I'm here if you have any questions. Yeah, that's amazing, Ricardo. Yeah, you need really to talk about all of the cases, to list all of them, because we are talking about a cases publication. It's interesting to learn about your pitch book. Nice initiative. It's important for us to strengthen the bridges between the investors and the projects that need investment. Well, sadly, we are reaching the end of our session. And we won't be able to have a Q&A with our panelists, but we have received more than 80 questions since the beginning. Some of them have been answered already. Those that have not been answered will be forwarded to the panelists. And we can even publish them, maybe. We'll talk with the communication department. We had circa 700 people in our room with us today, and we know that that shows a great interest and appetite that the Brazilian community has for this topic. So the more 
we can keep nurturing the network, bringing more information to this network of actors that think and actually execute the actions that will be amazing. So I would like to thank you so much. And I apologize again for not being able to open to a Q&A. But um, we want to thank deeply all of you that coordinates these cases around Brazil and the world. Each of the panelists has were with us since the beginning, the first remarks till the end, and we are committed as WRI Brazil to answer your questions, I hope in a public document so everyone can learn from it. Our publication is available, guys, all the videos, all the collateral materials and also the researches that are related to the topic. It's all in our website, WRI Brazil. You have the link on the chat. So thank you all so much. I wish you all a great afternoon or evening and hope to be together soon to talk more about the advances of this collective agenda and we count on all of you. Thank you so much.